Welcome to the Baptist Health Doc to Doc podcast, a conversation for physicians by physicians, providing insight on the latest in medical practice, research, technology, and innovation in healthcare. Join Baptist Health experts as they offer practical advice for clinicians covering a wide range of specialties. Cancer, neuroscience, orthopedics, and cardiovascular care are just some of the timely discussions you'll find right here on the Doc to Doc podcast. I would like to welcome our listeners to another Miami Neuroscience Institute podcast. My name is Michael McDermott, Chief Medical Executive of Miami Neuroscience Institute. And today we have Dr. Michael Gomez, who's a spinal neurosurgeon and director of minimally invasive spine surgery at Baptist Health Miami Neuroscience Institute at South Miami Hospital. Uh, Dr. Gomez, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to discuss this topic. And let's start by having you define what minimally invasive spine surgery of the, of the lumbar spine actually is compared to other types of lumbar spinal surgery. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, minimally invasive spine surgery essentially allows us to accomplish the same thing that we are able to accomplish with open surgery, but we do it through smaller incisions with uh, less disruption of tissue. Um, and so minimally invasive spine surgery presumably refers to the size of the opening and the use of different instruments. Is that correct? Yes and no. Uh, so typically it does refer to the size of the, of the incision, um, but we also utilize some alternative corridors to the spine that allow us to uh, generate less tissue damage, but also allows us to accomplish the same things that we typically do with with traditional approaches. So we use a series of of retractors that either split the muscle um, or uh, retractors that help to to hold muscles aside so that we um, wind up with less bleeding and and less uh, inflammation in patients. Now, interoperative navigation and interoperative imaging have become an important part of accurate, efficient, and safe spine surgery using minimally invasive techniques. Can you discuss some of the technology that you're currently using in the operating room to assist with this kind of MIS surgery? Sure. Interoperative navigation has just blown minimally invasive spine surgery wide open. Um, you know, when you're doing traditional open procedures, you have all these landmarks that you can guide yourself by. But when you're working through small incisions, um, you know, you don't have these landmarks. And so using traditional fluoroscopy or, or live x-ray um, can be quite difficult. So now um, with interoperative navigation, we're able to obtain a CT scan of the spine while we're in the operating room. And we send those images to a uh, special computer that lets us navigate in the spine. And so, um, you know, we've been doing this with brain surgery for many years, and now this allows us to bring that that safety to the uh, to the spine, and also allows us to reduce the amount of of radiation that that patients get. And is it true that you now monitor nerve and muscle function as part of some of the techniques you use? Yeah, so we've been doing that for many years uh, where in the operating room, we use a special type of monitoring where they place electrodes in the muscle and allows us to uh, gauge whether we're irritating a nerve and also allows us to gauge whether that that nerve is is functioning normally or even if it's regained function during surgery. Hmm. Could you briefly describe... Um posterior spinal approaches to lumbar spine that are classified as minimally invasive, and then maybe some of the anterior approaches also classified as such. Sure. So the, the spine can be approached um, via posterior uh, surgery, which is a, a traditional approach. It can also be um, approached from the front or from the side, and oftentimes we're using multiple approaches at once. So Traditionally, in, in open spine surgery, we'd make a, a midline incision. We would peel the muscle off of the bone. And with um, retractor development, we can use a series of tube retractors that can split the muscle in order to, to traumatize the muscle less. Um, and so 
now, for example, if we perform what's called a, a, a T lift or a transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, this is typically used to decompress the spine and also to uh, to stabilize it. We are able to operate through two small incisions instead of one big incision in the midline, where where on uh, you know one side we we split the muscle and and we do all our bone work and we're able to place a cage in the disc space and we're also able to place our screws on that side and on the opposite side we're able to open the skin dissect the muscle with our finger in order to traumatize it less and and place more screws that way and that's kind of the most common posterior uh, approach to the spine what uh i am most interested in is utilizing an an alternative to the uh, traditional posterior approach. Um, and I think this really allows us to uh, take lots of factors into account, including the the patient's uh, age, their level of osteoporosis, and, and also allows us to correct deformities. So taking alternative routes through the side of the abdomen or through the front of the abdomen, abdomen we're able to, uh, to place large cages that that um, you know correct deformities that straighten out the spine, and by using these large cages with large surface area, um, we're able to operate on patients who have kind of less than optimal bone quality and still provide them a a better quality of life. You know, you mentioned uh, bone density uh, there in your discussion, and I was wondering how important has that become for assessing patients prior to big, bigger operations or even minimally invasive operations where a lumbar bony fusion is required. Do you, what kind of testing do you do before? And is there any pre-surgical treatment that you recommend in patients with uh, obvious osteopenia and osteoporosis? Bone density is a huge deal now. Um, and I think mostly because 70 is the new 60, right? So um, when you have when you're when you have older patients that um, really want to enjoy retirement, they want to be active, they want to travel, um, and they need a surgery, then you have to be able to to take care of them while minimizing the risk of surgery. So typically, before surgery, we will order a a bone mineral density scan, and and that kind of allows us to to gauge what their bone quality is. Hmm. Um, and preoperatively, patients can be optimized with a number of different um, medications for for bone mineral density, and and if really necessary, we would start this about six months before surgery. Um, but with these uh, newer approaches to the spine, the anterior and the lateral approaches to the spine, by using uh, implants that match the size of the disc space, in other words, you know, larger surface area implants, we're able to operate on these people with less than optimal bone without um, having issues such as uh, vertebral body fractures or or the cages sinking in into the bone. I mean, think of it, at, compare a, a stiletto heel with with a big chunky heel walking across a golf course, right? So yeah. um, if you use a small implant, it's more likely to sink into the bone, whereas a nice big implant with a lot of surface area is is less likely to do so. Yeah. When they do the assessment of bone density, is that specifically of the lumbar spine or is it an assessment of the entire uh, bony skeleton? So they typically will assess the spine and the hips, and the and the World Health Organization ha has defined the femoral neck as as mm -hmm. your uh, standard for for assessing bone mineral density because because a uh, hip fracture is so catastrophic, um, and oftentimes the the lumbar spine just because of of uh, arthritic changes is going to be artificially uh, elevated. Mm -hmm. So we kind of split the difference and um but I, I typically use the the femoral neck as as my guide for for, for uh, bone mineral density okay what are uh, some of the potential advantages of uh, minimally invasive technique in terms of length of hospital stay 
time to recovery and long-term outcomes compared to some of the older techniques, which require big skin incisions and big muscle splitting operations. Yeah, in in my experience, you know, I, I do both. Um, mm. I think that patients undergoing minimally invasive surgeries, whether it's a, a minimally invasive posterior fusion or a minimally invasive lateral fusion, these patients are typically up and walking around the day of surgery. Mm. Um, they, we don't use drains, which oftentimes a, a surgical drain can can keep patients hospitalized for three or four days. Um, and, and typically patients go home the day after surgery. Um, and the way I counsel my patients, I, I sort of, I, I, uh, I set them up with, with expectations. I think that the first two to three weeks after surgery are the most uncomfortable by six weeks, I would say that they should feel about 75% recovered at three months, about 90% recovered. And then at six months, I'd say they ought to feel normal. Um, whereas when patients have a large open incision where we, you know, we strip the bone off the, or strip the muscle off the bone, typically that results in more inflammation, more blood loss. And we use drains to, to manage any fluid collections between the muscles. So it heals nicely. So just having a patient spend four or five days in the hospital after a big open surgery that you're, you're sort of starting off kind of behind the eight ball. Yeah, I'm from personal experience. I had a L5S1 discectomy through a tube, didn't require any fusion, but I had the surgery on Friday. I took two doses of a narcotic and that was it. And I went back to work on Tuesday and uh, I was amazed, you know, how well, obviously I, how well I felt because the pressure was off the nerve root, um, but it was really an uneventful uh, recovery and very quick. Um, what's the, the, um, minimally invasive technique that you pr practice most frequently and tell us what type of patient is a candidate for that surgery. I think the surgery that I've become best known for is the lateral lumbar interbody fusion where we make a small incision in the left abdomen on, on the side and that lets us get to the side of the spine and we're able to remove the disc completely and place a tall cage into the disc space to restore the height of the disc space. And in doing so, it allows us to correct the deformity, to decompress the nerves where they exit uh, in the foramen of the small holes on the side, and also allows us to um, decompress the nerves in the spinal canal. And then we stabilize the spine with screws and rods. Uh, and this surgery typically takes us about two hours. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's generally um, indicated for patients with a deformity called a spondylolisthesis or patients with a, a focal scoliosis, or patients who have had previous surgery and, um, and have developed narrowing of the, uh, of the holes on the sides where the nerves exit. Yeah. Uh, what's the usual operative time for an anterior posterior minimally invasive operation? Yeah, so for the anterior posterior, typically about two hours, depending really on the uh, on the surgeon that's providing the exposure for us in the case of an L5-S1 fusion, um, and about the same about two hours with a lateral lumbar fusion. Hmm. Okay. Uh, have you been happy to date with the outcomes from these operations? Obviously, that's your focus for practice, so yeah, I'm assuming the answer would be yes, um, and you do both the big open and the minimally invasive. Um, your thoughts? You know, uh, I've gone from being a, a posterior only surgeon, say as of, uh, you know, as of 2018, I was a posterior only surgeon. And since then, I, I gradually incorporated the lateral and the anterior approaches. And now um, I really do try to find a way to do it either laterally or, or from the front if possible, and then use a, a posterior approach um, if, mm. if absolutely necessary, because I think the patients, they recover uh, quickly. And as I said, we use these these cages with, with lots of surface area. So my concern about the bone not healing properly or the cage sinking into the bone is, is less of an issue. Well, cool. 
Now, this is the last question, but I think it's probably the most important. And that is, do you have any words of wisdom for the patients out there regarding advice or cautions for any type of lumbar spine surgery, um, you know, conventional or otherwise? And I guess that's really a decision-making process uh, between the patient and the surgeon. Um, but it, it's been said that a lot of the lumbar spine surgery may be, quote, unnecessary, end quote. So for the most part, when I see patients in the office, um, you know, these patients are, they're doing okay, right? They they don't have any emergency condition. And, and so the way that I counsel them is that, you know, very few people absolutely need spine surgery. In other words, uh, most people are not going to wind up in a wheelchair or or lose the use of their legs uh, for, you know, not having a a lumbar spine surgery. There's a lot of things that you can do before you get to the OR, right? You can pursue physical therapy with the goal of developing a strong core so it supports your spine better. There are uh, interventional pain procedures, so epidural steroid injections. And I think if you are going to have a surgery, you really do have to be all in um, because, you know, surgery is almost the, the smallest part of the whole process, right? It's, it's a two hour surgery, but then mm. you've got maybe a three month to six month recovery. So if, if you are going to have a surgery, I think that you need to be all in, you need to ha have done your homework, you need to have, have tried to exercise and done some sort of pre rehab before you you get to the surgery um, and and then after that you know after the the surgery is said and done then you need to make sure to get yourself in as good a shape as possible again make sure you have a really strong core and and try to keep your weight down yeah I think um, it's important for the patients to realize that they have a role to play in their own healing and that involves you know adherence to specified uh, exercise protocols and weight loss if that's necessary. Uh, but Dr. Gomez, thank you uh, for taking the time today um, and to our listeners uh, for taking the time to listen to this podcast. And if you have any further questions or would like your primary care physician or all just to refer your case to Dr. Gomez, please contact us. And thanks again. To find out more about the topics covered on the Doc to Doc podcast, please visit physicianresources.baptisthealth.net.